Thank you, Dan. Um, we do have a couple of audience members here. Uh, I just want to point out that the task force members here that are present, we will promote everybody as panelists. Um, if we do have audience members, that's great. Uh, we welcome you to listen in on the discussion. And uh, if you are interested in um, getting updates on this project, uh, you can uh, feel free to head over to our Let's Talk Wilsonville page, go to the Housing Our Future project and sign up for project updates. Um, otherwise, uh, we will I see we've got a couple more people hopping on here right now. Um, Councillor Barry, do you want to go ahead and kick off the meeting for us? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, so I just okay. switched my audio to my computer. Can you hear okay. me okay? Yes, you're a little soft, but I can hear you. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so let me just... So, um, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is the City of Wilson Housing Production uh, Strategy Meeting. It's the Housing Our Future Task Force Meeting Number 2. Today is August 6th. Um, the meeting goes from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So I'm glad everybody is here. Um, should we do introductions? Should we go through? So um, my name is Carolyn Berry. I'm on the city council. And I'm really happy to participate in the housing committee because I think that's such an important issue, not only in Wilsonville, but in our entire state and our nation. So. Thank you to the staff for all their hard work. All right, um, I'll go next. Uh, I'll introduce uh, the staff who are present here uh, at today's meeting. I'm Kim Reibold, senior planner with the city and project manager for the Housing Our Future project. I know we did introductions last time, but we do have a couple new faces here at this meeting. So I wanna be able to share, we be sure we can all say hi. Um, I will let uh, Dan Polly, our planning manager, and then Marina Bateshell, our planning director, introduce themselves. Hi, Dan Polly, the city's planning manager. I'm uh, excited about this project and thanks for being here. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Kim and team, and thanks to all of you for being here and for serving on this committee. Uh, we are uh, this is really important work, and we're looking forward to uh, the result at the end of this project. So I uh, just wanted to say thank you, good afternoon, and look forward to the discussion. All right, and then I do want to introduce the consultant team with us that is assisting with the project as well, uh, Beth and Nicole. Hi, I'm Beth Goodman. I'm the project director on this with Echo Northwest, and I'm happy to be talking with you all. Hi, and I'm Nicole Underwood, and I'm uh, a project manager at Echo Northwest, and like everyone else, very happy to be here. All right, uh, and then I'm going to just go ahead and walk through the task force members we have here. Uh, Commissioner Willard. Hello, Jennifer Willard, planning commissioner. Um, hello, everyone. All right, uh, Lee. Hi, Lee Crosby, Wilsonville Community Sharing. Nice to be here with you guys. Hey, Chris. Chris, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sorry. Yep. Uh, Chris Ayosa. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Housing Authority of Clackamas County. This is my first meeting, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, Samuel. Hey, Samuel Goldberg. Uh, he, him pronouns. I am the public policy manager at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. Apologies that I had a conflict for the first meeting, but I'm uh, very happy I could make it to this one. Trell. Good afternoon, Trell Anderson. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the CEO at Northwest Housing Alternatives. We're a nonprofit affordable housing developer and owner. We have two properties in Wilsonville and we work statewide and really um, thankful to be um, invited to join the discussion. Thank you. Right, and Maria. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Vargas. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Economic Justice at Latino Network. All right. So, did we introduce everybody? Yes, I believe so. Oh, no. Who did we miss that? I think we missed Jennifer, unless I just missed her. You, we, we did. No, I think we went, we did me. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome. Jennifer Willard, Planning Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad everybody's here, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to offer and uh, from hearing from our planning consultants. Um, and hearing their expertise. So thank you in advance. Um, so we're gonna start off with the overview of the housing production strategy and spend about 20 minutes talking about this. So let's start. I, is Beth, do you have a presentation for us? I do have a presentation. I'm sure you're all very excited by me having a PowerPoint. Um, and the PowerPoint will be made available, Kim, after the meeting, I believe. Correct, so correct. We'll send this. out the PowerPoint and a meeting summary uh, sometime in the next week or so. Thank you. And so this is our second meeting of uh, the Housing Our Future Task Force. For those of you who missed our first meeting, if you have questions about the housing needs and capacity analysis, I think we'll be happy to answer those for you separately. Um, direct your uh, questions to Kim and she can either answer them or she can uh, tell us and we can answer them for you. Um, so we're just gonna walk through our presentation, hoping to keep it a little bit light on the data today um, and then heavy on the discussion um, through the second three quarters of the meeting. So here we are um, uh, with our project schedule. We're still in the sort of early mid part, part of this project where what we're doing is we're looking at more deeply at what housing needs are in Wilsonville. Um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, we've got a number of other meetings coming up, uh, task force three and four um, in through the uh, later summer and fall um, in beginning of winter, where we'll be doing a lot more discussing than we'll do today about the actions, the strategies that we'll be developing in the housing production strategy. Um, but today's an intro to those. And then we will be developing the draft and final housing production strategy um, next uh, winter and spring and adoption into April and May of 2025. So that's our schedule. Um, we do have uh, a, uh, we are doing this on a grant from the state. So we do have a need to complete the project, um, at least complete it to an adoption ready housing production strategy by May, 2025. So to start with uh, talking about engagement, where we've been and where we're going to go. Um, so we've completed a number of uh, engagements either this year or last year. Um, uh, a number of them are on the list for last year and we did our first task force meeting earlier this year. Here we're on our second task force meeting. We'll be um, doing some interviews in the upcoming month or two. Um, focusing on people with unmet housing needs in Wilsonville. Um, we'll be doing a specific uh, uh, community event, um, uh, I believe with the Latino community, talking to that group of people about what their housing needs are beyond simply um, about um, affordable housing and access to housing. So to understand more of the nuances of that. And then we've got this thing here called the conversation guide. What the conversation guide is, is a, uh, a method for uh, people to do outreach, sort of uh, more grassroots um, on their own um, using a conversation guide that Echo Northwest is developing um, and then giving the results of that um, to the city. So if you have a, uh, uh, say a community group or a church group that you'd really like to talk about um, some of these issues with, um, the conversation guide will provide guidance on that. That's something we'll be developing here over the next uh, month or two. Um, and then later in the projects um, on towards uh, 2025, we'll have an open house about what we're finding here and some of the approaches that the city is, is looking at uh, taking to better meet unmet housing needs. So that's what's coming up in terms of engagement. If people have questions, you know, raise your hands or 
frantically wave or or whatever, and we'll stop and answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead on. So a housing production strategy is a six-year action plan that uh, identifies strategies or actions to meet the city's housing needs, both in the near term, so over the next six years, and then in the longer term. Um, so setting the city up um, in the future for, uh, uh, for better meeting housing needs as well. This isn't just about developing new housing, this is about preservation of existing affordable housing. So we start with this concept of contextualizing housing need. It pulls information in from the housing needs and capacity analysis. It pulls information about people experiencing homelessness, which is typically not represented in an awful lot of the data that we're working with. And it also pulls information in about historically marginalized communities and uh, other protected classes. Um, and a lot of that information will be presenting to you some of the qualitative, uh, the quantitative information, the numbers that we have. But the numbers are, uh, they don't tell the whole story. Um, so that's what um, parts of our engagement um, are getting to. And we're pulling from what we've learned from other studies that have been done um, in the region, um, because there's quite a lot known about unmet housing need. So based on that, we're developing strategies to meet future housing need. Um, and incorporating the concepts of affirmatively furthering fair housing um, uh, to get to a set of strategies that are either things that the city already does or things in the housing production strategy that achieve more fair and equitable housing outcomes. Um, and that will be in your housing production strategy, your HPS report, that the city will implement these actions over the next six years. So these actions in and of themselves, you know, may not move the uh, uh, move things a lot on their own um, in terms of uh, housing affordability, but they work together with the city's existing policy framework um, and other actions in the HPS. Uh, and then there'll be annual reporting and the city is required to, reporting to, well, both the city does its own annual reporting, but also reporting to the state, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and at the three year period of the HPS, there'll be a, uh, a more intensive reporting and reflection for how things are going. So that's that's sort of the, the highest level of what we're doing and where we're going towards. Then diving into what are our housing needs um, in Wilsonville in the context of, uh, we'll, we'll start with income and then we'll get into uh, more detailed information about different groups. So this is in the context of uh, the Portland region, three county region, Clackamas, Washington, and Multnomah counties. 100% uh, a household of four that earns 100% of median family income earns uh, has an income of about $116,900. And so you do the simple math for that, what they can afford without um, paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs is about $2,900 a month in rent or a mortgage payment of that. And that also includes certain basic utilities um, like electricity and heat. So the idea here is that um, uh, this household without being cost burdened, without paying more than 30% of its income on housing costs can afford about $2,900 uh, a month in uh, housing costs. Well, when you look at the median sales price of a house in Wilsonville, earlier this month, um, it's about $585,000. Um, well, that household that has 100% uh, of median family income cannot afford that. Um, they can afford, uh, you know, depending, maybe up to 380,000. So that's way below median. Um, and then when you look at average monthly rent, um, which we're figuring in um, some basic utilities is around $2,000. Um, obviously, that household of four could afford that rent um, on a monthly basis. Um, and so then we've got um, households that earn 80% of median family income, 60%, 30%, and then above median family income. And we're modeling it this way um, for a number of reasons, in part because different housing types are built that are affordable at different um, income levels. So a household of four that earns uh, sixty percent of median family income has income of about seventy thousand dollars a year. They could afford about seventeen hundred dollars a month in housing costs, 
Um, and obviously that's below the average monthly rent in Wilsonville. So to afford that rent, they would be cost burden. They can't afford that rent. Um, households with incomes of below 60% of median family income are typically um, new housing for, for those groups is typically built um, as income restricted housing. So things, uh, people like your Northwest Housing Authority, uh, Northwest Housing Alternatives, I apologize there, Trell. Um, they're building that kind of housing or your, uh, your housing authority is building that kind of housing. Housing that's affordable between 60 and 80% of median family income is typically not, not built very often. You just can't build that if you're a developer and have it be financially feasible because of the costs of development. Most new housing that's built, be it multifamily or other types of housing, um, tends to come in affordable somewhere above 80% of median family income. And when you look at new single family housing, quite obviously your median home sales price or your median home, um, 585,000, half are above that, half are below that, an awful lot are sort of concentrated right around that. Um, so newly built uh, uh, homes uh, for sale, they're affordable at your highest income levels. And so when we look at this, what this uh, means in Wilson bill, you look at your distribution of households by income level, well, 25% of your households in Wilsonville um, uh, are in the high income group. Um, and uh, what you have is quite nearly half of your households, a little less than uh, half in the 40% range, um, have income below 60% of median family income. And so if your future households have a similar income distribution, um, and this isn't that far off of the regional income distribution, then they're going to need housing that is um, affordable uh, at less than 60% of median family income, or they're going to need um, income restricted housing built. It's quite a lot of uh, income restricted housing. Um, you've got 11% of your households that uh, have income between 60 and 80%, and then 22% that are in that middle income group. So this is sort of the landscape by income. Before I go on to the landscape by uh, characteristic of people, um, are there questions? All right, then I will go on. So um, to state the obvious, housing needs differ by different groups of people. And so some of the bigger groups of people that we're looking with here are people experiencing homelessness, um, and what we see is that in Clackamas County in 2022, the point in time count um, estimated that there were about 571 people um, experiencing homelessness in Clackamas County in 2022. Um, uh, people who work in this area, um, uh, people experiencing homelessness, know that the point in time count, while it's useful information, it's also incomplete information. Um, we know that the point in time count, um, because of the way it's done and, and potentially when it's done, it um, underestimates the number of people experiencing homelessness. Um, in uh, the research that we did for the Oregon housing needs analysis, um, our best estimate, and it's a, a basic estimate, is it underestimates uh, the people experiencing homelessness by about 1.8 uh, times as many people. So in other words, there's probably closer to 1,000, 1,025 people experiencing homelessness in Clackamas County than what we're showing here. So we know this is like a minimum and almost certainly too low. So when you think about the housing needs for people experiencing homelessness, um, obviously it's access to housing um, that is affordable. Um, it's oftentimes access to housing with services, so permanent supportive housing. Um, then you also have, uh, uh, you know, need to um, uh, move people out of being unsheltered or on the street um, or an emergency shelter into you know, housing that may not be permanent housing, but that is, uh, uh, you know, le less temporary um, and then into longer term housing. And so there's a, a number of steps there. Um, and of course, um, one of the things that people experiencing homelessness need access to housing is uh, housing uh, without discrimination. And without discrimination is something that we, we talk about an awful lot here. Um, and uh, I'm glad that we've got Samuel here um, from the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, 
because if anybody wants to hear uh, some of the stories about people experiencing discrimination, I'm betting Samuel has some doozies that he's heard. Um, so, uh, so yes. So then going on to some of our other groups, looking at uh, uh, people of uh, people of color. So um, in Wilsonville, your largest community of color is your Latin community, about 3,400 people in Wilsonville. It's about 13% of your population. It's about the same as uh, the percent of population in the three county Portland region um, who are let, uh, Latin, so 13%. So you're about in that representation group. I'm gonna talk about Clackamas County data rather than Wilsonville data here for um, difference in median household income. These lines that you see on the chart, um, they are margin of error lines, they're, they're uh, whiskers. Um, and where you see those, um, a big long whisker represents more uncertainty in the data. Um, and so for instance, you know, for Clackamas County, this little tiny whisker um, means that there's a small margin of error for overall um, median household income a little bit uh, bigger um, for Wilsonville, but when we look at the um, Latin population in Wilsonville, it's a bigger margin of error because it's a small population. Um, on the other hand, we know that there are certain things about Wilsonville that are, are pretty similar to Clackamas County. Um, so when we look at different um, difference in income uh, in Clackamas County for Latin uh, uh, populations, households, it's about, $73,000 a year compared to an overall average of $88,000 a year. Um, and that is, uh, I think I, I looked at it, I of course didn't write down the number, um, but that's somewhere around 83% of uh, the overall um, income. So Latin households have about 83% of the overall average income. In other words, they have lower average income on average. If I could say average a few more times, I would. Um, so uh, so the ability to pay for housing and the access to housing that is affordable um, is going to be lower for Latin households. Um, so uh, those households are certainly going to need access to housing that is affordable. Um, they're also going to need access to housing that is culturally appropriate. Um, so Latin households on average have larger household size. That can be because of more children. It can also be um, because of multi-generational um, uh, households. And so your household composition really matters um, for what kind of housing you need, um, be it rental or ownership. Um, uh, so do you need more bedrooms? Do you need two kitchens? Um, do you essentially need two units that are, are really in close contact with each other for multi-generational housing? Um, there's other um, unmet housing needs uh, for the Latin population that we'll be getting into more as we're continuing these uh, conversations um, with uh, the community. And some of them are things that that the city can certainly do something about. In other words, they're within some of the levers that the city has, policy levers, and some of them are outside of what the city can do. Um, uh, for instance, uh, credit history issues or uh, having the appropriate, um, the necessary uh, documentation like a driver's license or, or something like that. So some of these are are within what the city can can influence. I'm going to interrupt and uh, yes, just let you know about three more minutes. Mm. All right, you're going to keep me on task. All right, I'll I'll go a little faster here. So um, ability to pay for people who are older, um, and I'm going to go over this one a little quicker because it really merges with the next one. Um, what you see is households that are 65 years and older. They have lower average uh, income on average than households that are younger. It's not surprising. Um, your uh, income peaks um, uh, before retirement and decreases after that. And a lot of people who are older um, have uh, uh, have uh, limited income. So then housing for people with a disability, about 12% of Wilsonville's population has one or more disabilities. Um, and an awful lot of people with a disability are also older people. So what I say here will um, we'll, uh, go between the two groups. Um, so you need housing, um, access to housing that's affordable. I don't have it in here, but people with a disability on average typically have lower income than the overall household. You need housing that's accessible. Um, so physically accessible if you've got an uh, ambulatory difficulty. Um, if you have a, uh, 
a cognitive difficulty or mental health difficulty, then you may need access to housing that is uh, that has services associated with it. Um, you also uh, need access to housing um, without discrimination. Um, so that comes there too. And then, uh, so evidently our initial themes, and these are really initial, is access to housing that's affordable, be it rental or ownership, diverse housing types. You've got small households, you've got larger households. Some people are going to um, uh, qualify for and need income restricted affordable housing, and some are going to need market rate housing that's affordable for them. Access to a housing that meets your household needs, um, again, size and configuration number of uh, bedrooms with needed services, um, and then physical accessibility. Um, and then always access to housing without discrimination. So what we're going to uh, be doing with the interviews um, and some of the other outreach work we're doing is fill in some more meat here. Um, Cause we know these basic things, these are true uh, really everywhere. And um, Councillor Barry, I think I probably may have made it in in my three minutes. Did. I have 45 more seconds. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? Am I missing anything? When I say I, I mean we. So I do want to pause for a second. Uh, we do have um, a couple of task force members who have joined. Uh, so I just, one is on phone. So um, I believe uh, Dan needs to formally somehow unmute. So uh, Dan, would you like to go ahead and do that? now it's done okay great and then um also for eric uh if you get a panelist request please go ahead and accept that and then we'll we'll get you here on the panel so um that's all i do see we have a question now Trail. thank you uh beth thank you really nice data and I appreciate the graphics and the presentation. Um, do, are we able to take the uh, income data and assess that against um, units available so that there is yeah. a production of sorry, dog just sounded the alarm. He's a, a big, um, big lab mix and I'm gonna go deal with him as soon as I finish this comment. Mm -hmm. What I don't see is, you know, the income strata compared to pricing that's currently available, which would suggest the gaps that for housing production that were as targets. Unfortunately, that data doesn't exist. Um, we've talked about this a lot in the Oregon housing needs analysis, the ONA, the statewide process, and everybody would like that data. Um, we have some sense from other information we have, like cost burden, cost burden by income level, that kind of thing of where the gaps are. Um, and obviously um, it's somewhere around $50,000 um, and a, a below um, is as the highest levels of cost burden. We've got that information in the document, but I don't have it right now. Um, and it's greater need um, uh, for households who are renters than households who are um, homeowners, generally speaking. Um, but there's there's you know a lot of need for for people who want to become homeowners um who but who can't afford to so we need some, we know some of that in qualitative ways thanks just just to follow up um the, i'm surprised to hear the data doesn't exist um and i wonder if it's just a matter of tapping into different re data resources um so, well, I mean, what, you could get some of the data. We've got things like CoStar data, um, but that's only some of the data about uh, rentals in Wilsonville. And so we have some more data about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but certainly comparing, uh, you know, the household incomes with uh, the affordable rents, there's a number of different reasons. I'm happy to talk to you about this mm -hmm. separately if mm -hmm. you'd like. Yeah, um, it just occurs to me if we're setting production goals, those goals need to be set by unit type and affordability. Well, a city is not required to set production goals at this point. Um, in the next version of the housing of the housing production strategy, it will come with goals, certainly. 
<laughs> and Wilsonville could set production goals. Um, and we could look at some of the draft results of the ONA that will be coming out um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the beginning of next year um, as a, a good way of, of giving us some guidance on that. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't give you guidance on type of housing though. Okay, and I'm, and last then that brings up for me, just from my understanding, and I apologize, it's the second meeting, I missed the first. Mm -hmm. The purpose of our effort here is to meet the requirements of, it's, it's, this is a compliance process? At a minimum, the city can go further. If the city chooses to set goals, it certainly can. Um, and we can get you know some information about how to set those goals. But uh, I would say that, that doing the analysis that you're talking about um, would be a considerable amount of technical work beyond uh, uh, what we're scoped to do, essentially. And I'll just jump in from the city's point of view here. I think uh, a couple key pieces. First, I'm happy to take some time as well if you want to chat since you did miss that first meeting to talk through any of the questions that are in. There's a lot of data in there. There's like we asked a lot of the same questions you're asking right now. Um, we have been tracking, so just for everybody's awareness, when we refer to ONA, this is kind of a, a we're working in this compliance framework that we have right now in this process. So we're required to assess housing needs and then put together a housing production strategy, which is what we're going to start talking about as a means to assess what kind of strategies will help us meet those needs we've defined in that first document, which is what we talked about at the first meeting. Uh, there is a more robust, enhanced process that's being reviewed at the state level right now. There's still rules being made around it, and that that is what is called the ONA, essentially taking that housing needs analysis that's being done on an individualized city level, but actually looking at a more macro level about housing needs throughout the state and um, target for cities and things, um, but that that process hasn't wrapped up yet. And so we're we're working a bit in this in between right now when it comes to meeting our statutory requirements for what we have to adopt here. Um, that being said, in Wilsonville, and, and as you probably know, since you've been in the community for a while, we do care about thoughtfully planning for housing. It's something that we've done over the course of several years. We actually put together the equitable housing uh, strategy five or so years ago in recognition of that. So I think um, from my perspective, one of the goals that we hope to get out of this process now is to take a look at you know, what we've already done, what what's still out there that we haven't done but could do, and really get um, the input of this group to inform our policymakers as to where we should be focusing our efforts with those strategies. Recognizing that we are moving into this newer framework that we will have to um, follow the next time around and that we will be tracking uh, the, um, the data and the targets that come out of this process. Um, it's just that we, we we don't have a full picture of what that looks like yet, and we, we don't want to jump ahead of that process, um, but we are kind of working in this space right now where we have an awareness of that and knowing that that's happening and thinking about how we can position ourselves well in this strategy to be able to meet those requirements in the future. So. Yeah, thank, thank you for um, level setting all of that for me. I appreciate it. One of the... Um, excitements for me to join this group in Wilsonville, because we, we get excited to join other city planning efforts as well, is because I'm, I am aware of the history of housing planning in Wilsonville, and you are typically ahead of other municipalities, and I very much appreciate that. Thank you, Kim. And I'll just add in that some of the information we have in the housing needs and capacity analysis um, tells us about the extraordinary levels of cost burden um, and gives us a forecast of new household, uh, households um, and the types of housing um, that Wilsonville's planning for, um, a lot of which is middle housing um, and some multifamily housing, so. So with that, I'm going to jump in um, so we can get started on the second segment, which is asking questions and then um, presenting our viewpoints. So now we're gonna talk about developing the housing production strategy and discuss the existing and potential strategies. Mm -hmm. um, so what strategies do you think the city should explore further 
And are there strategies that we haven't thought of that aren't in the memorandum that we should consider? So for this segment, Kim is going to lead the discussion. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we get into um, this discussion, so something to think about, we will have a couple of slides that Beth will present that provide a little, little more information on what that housing production strategy piece of this work is. Um, and then we're, we're going to offer an opportunity if there are any questions about the information that was in the handout that you all got last week, uh, we can answer those. And then we're going to try to do like a round robin style of discussion to allow everybody here to provide us feedback on those key questions. So um, as you listen to the information that Beth will share in the next few minutes, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, you are on this task force because you possess expertise that we want to learn from as we start putting together this strategy. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to Beth. So the first question um, uh, in developing a housing production strategy is understanding the city's role in development. And of course, this, this really dis depends on what the city wants its role in development to be. There's a lot of things that cities can do, and we'll talk about a lot of those. Um, but at a highest level, development can occur when you've got land um, uh, where you can do building. We've got public policy that supports that building with the right zoning and density, design requirements, all of these other things, um, where the developer has access to capital um, and where they can, in a market, that they can develop housing um, that is uh, uh, with sufficient rents or sales prices to support a profitable project, so marketable fee market feasibility. This is really focused on uh, uh, market rate housing development, affordable housing development is is different um, in a number of different ways, like having different access um, to capital and different considerations about market feasibility, of course. Um, but Wilsonville can really directly influence public policy. Obviously, you've set your zoning, uh, your zoning map, um, your zoning ordinance in a certain way. You've done your your area plans for places like Frog Pond, um, uh, you're doing more planning around town center, that kind of thing. So Wilsonville has very direct uh, control over public policy in large part. Wilsonville always also um, has a big role to play in infrastructure development um, uh, through uh, actually developing the infrastructure and how it's paid for and the arrangements um, of that. Um, obviously, um, in the housing production, um, housing capacity and needs analysis, um, oh, we determined that Wilsonville has sufficient land, um, if that land can be developed um, over this next uh, six years, and then, you know, more like over 20 years. Um, there's certain uh, caveats in that um, around uh, development of town center and in that kind of thing. Um, Wilsonville can play a role in market feasibility. Um, through things like property tax exemptions, um, uh, system development charge uh, setting, and uh, in certain cases, whether they um, exempt those, which really means pay those in a different way. Cities have a smaller um, role to play in capital. So uh, cities don't generally loan large amounts of uh, money to uh, developers. Um, in some cases, uh, cities do. Um, so a lot of this ends up being um, public policy. What is the city willing and then able um, financially as well as staff capacity wise to do? Um, there's a lot of different strategies um, that we'll talk about. Um, some of them are more impactful and some of them are less impactful. So like partnering to leverage um, efforts and resources or removing regulatory barriers, those are over on the less impactful, but they're often necessary um, uh, and to support development of housing um, that is more affordable, but they're not sufficient on their own. Just taking away a regulatory barrier may not result um, uh, in direct housing uh, development, especially housing development that's more affordable. So the more impactful actions um, essentially involve resources. So uh, land um, acquisition and disposition, the city can buy land, um, convey it to an affordable housing developer or a community land trust for future development. 
Um, the city um, uh, has a number of different ways to allocate funding, collect and allocate funding, et cetera. So keep that in mind. Um, many of these actions on their own may not result in new housing development or new affordable housing development, but taken uh, together, um, they can create a package that does. So when we're developing the housing production strategies, we're thinking about whether the city's existing policies and new policies are going to achieve fair and uh, equitable housing outcomes for affordable home ownership and rental housing. So producing more of that, um, uh, avoiding gentrification or displacement or increasing housing stability, such as preservation of existing relatively affordable housing, creating more housing options for people experiencing homelessness, um, creating more housing options in areas with compact mixed use, um, especially where you've got access to transit, housing choice in safe neighborhoods with high quality amenities, and those can be things like access to transit. They can also be things like access, you know, proximity to schools and work and so on and so forth. And then increasing fair housing, um, especially for federal and state protected classes. Overall, we're looking for all of these actions to work together to increase these fair and equitable housing outcomes. So existing strategies. Um, I don't think I want to read through all of these, but if you have questions, we can certainly ask Miranda to uh, to answer the questions. The city does quite a bit of monitoring um, and reporting on development every year. It's made a number of development code amendments to allow a wider ra range of housing um, and to make housing development um, more clear and objective. The city um, did some disposition of land for affordable housing at the uh, transit oriented development site, which is uh, under development um, now and will be developed here in the next, uh, I think year or two. Um, uh, looking at a vertical housing uh, development zone, which is a type of tax abatement, I think. Um, looking at system development charges um, and deferring them in some cases, very selected cases. Um, implementing the nonprofit corporate low income property tax exemption, um, sleep safe, sl mm, safe sleep sites for people experiencing homelessness, and then accessibility requirements for people with disabilities in Frog Pond, which could provide a, a model for the city. Um, so as Councillor Barry was saying, um, we're going to talk about some strategies in a few moments. Um, and after we, you know, cover um, those strategies, what we're looking for is uh, your feedback about whether these are a good starting point. Are we missing any from this list? Um, if so, what are we missing? Um, this is a uh, really high level. Um, uh, we'll be getting into more detail about uh, the actions that make it into the HPS in meetings three and four. So Kim, did you wanna walk through these strategies or did you want me to walk through these a little bit? Uh you can go ahead and do that. I, I do want to note, we're not going to explain all of them. Um, we just really want to touch on these. These were all, um, these all had a very uh, kind of condensed explanation of how they would work in the handout that you got. Um, there's, some, I think, some more information in terms of understanding the scope of each of these that I think we would need in order to kind of really tease them apart and figure out what is more or less effective. And so we're really kind of operating at a high level here. Um, the items that have been highlighted, I believe, are those that um, we've either kind of discussed a little more internally and or have um, have made an appearance in prior housing planning efforts and we just haven't quite you know gotten there and fully implemented them um i, I beth if you want to offer any other high level information i think i'd rather save more of the time to allow the group to ask questions they might have about the strategies okay um so uh since i do want to mention one of them on this slide the uh preserving existing housing slide um, and that's really about uh, uh, that. That's just so so vague. I always wonder what the heck is that. Um, it's basically uh, looking at a housing pr uh, preservation ordinance um, that looks at demolition or replacement of housing types um, uh, and uh, looks at you know uh, 
replace another of those housing types as relatively affordable housing or some sort of fee in lieu of that. Um, otherwise, there's a, a number of different ways to, you know, streamline or incentivize development, reduce development costs, preserve your existing housing and keep it um, long term affordable. Um, a number of tax exemptions um, related to uh, uh, ongoing housing costs, so lowering operational costs um, in exchange for um, affordability considerations, providing assistance to households, addressing homelessness, um, which is a particularly um, dif difficult um, uh, uh, piece, and oftentimes some of the ways in which you address homelessness are also via some of the other um, actions that we'd be looking at. Um, outreach and education, um, supporting um, housing equity, um, so such as through um, making accessible design um, some level of requirement, and then funding. How are you going to pay for all of this? Um, because while a number of these don't require uh, money, a number of these uh, do. So you've got your construction excise tax, which is commonly used um, uh, by cities in Oregon. Um, or other fees and, and dedicated revenue um, to support housing. Um, urban renewal, even though it's not on there in bold, a lot of cities use that. So I will I will turn it back to you, Kim, for facilitating the round robin discussion. And if you want me to talk about any of these more, um, please tell me. Sure. So uh, before we get into the discussion, uh, so these are kind of the general questions that we're hoping to hear your feedback on. Um, we're not asking you to rank things. We're not asking you to say which one you think is best. You know, that being said, if there's things that you're familiar with, observations you have about any of these strategies, gut reactions, you know, I think we're happy to hear those at this point, uh, just because we will be getting into more detail at our next meeting and really trying to weigh strategies that might be more appropriate. Um, but we also want to know that based on your experience, um, you know, is there anything that you don't see on here in this handout that, you know, we, we haven't done yet, you're not seeing here, but might be a good idea and you want us to look into a little bit more. Uh, so that's something we really want to hear about as well. Uh, so to be able to have this conversation, uh, first, we just want to take a few moments here and see if there's any questions based upon the material that we sent out to you um, prior to the meeting. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, oh, we've got one. Thank you, Samuel. Um, so since middle housing has been legal for a couple of years now, um, what, how do you think the uh, development of middle housing units has been going? Is that um, something that you're seeing a, a, a lot of permits for, or um, is that something that's been slow going? Um, I would say we're kind of in a unique position here. You know, every city in Oregon is different, and I think uh, cities have gone about implementing it differently. Uh, we are a newer city compared to others uh, in the metro region, and because of that, a lot of our development patterns, um, you know, a lot of our neighborhoods have things like HOAs, and so in some cases, an existing HOA can be restricted because even if we allow it, uh, CCNRs might not. Um, also, given the age of a lot of our housing development, um, you might not have kind of that redevelopment or infill being at as high of a potential as you might have in an area with older housing stock. Um, you know, the, and those properties often are not in an HOA. Um, so where we've seen it, uh, and we've actually seen these housing types, we've, um, throughout most of the city, we've actually allowed most of these housing types throughout our history. Um, but we have not seen a ton of infill middle housing. Where we have seen it um, most is in some of our new urban growth areas where we've had a little bit of an uptick in the attached uh, units. So like a you know, a duplex with a middle housing land division. And what the middle housing land division does is allow um, the units to be sold individually so that they can be home ownership units um, instead of, you know, on a single lot. Um, we've seen some, what we call the, it's like a detached duplex where 
Um, we're seeing that middle housing land division and getting a couple of smaller single family homes where it might have otherwise been a larger single unit. Um, the, the numbers aren't huge, but it has been used mostly in those newer growth areas. All right, Chell. Thanks. I'm happy to defer to Eric, who hasn't gone yet. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I haven't seen, it's a little bit more specific, but, you know, with new development, often there's requirements for infrastructure, right of way, utilities. I don't know what Wilsonville's code is, if they're requiring bearing of utilities, but if you guys are doing TIF districts or something of that nature to find funding, it can be kind of a win-win if those funds can go in to help for infrastructure and then that's done at the same time as the project and it's the responsibility of the developer, but um, eliminates a cost helps to subsidize. Yeah, um, our requirements, it's, um, you know, generally speaking, like a frontage requirement uh, that we have with development that has come up in a couple of um, infill when we've had inquiries about infill because oftentimes the areas where we are getting those inquiries are areas where we don't quite have the frontage improvements there that would otherwise be required by our transportation plans and engineering requirements. So, um, right. Any other questions right now? Charles, did you have a question? Yeah. Are you asking for input at the high level on what we see and what we don't see here? Um, I just want to make sure there aren't any other questions, okay. but um, if you want to volunteer to go first, if we don't have any other questions, feel free. I'm ready if there's no other questions. <laughs> um, three points. Um, one is the use of the city's full faith and um, credit as a strategy to support affordable housing production. Um, I local municipalities offer that to say um, a permanent loan uh, or a construction loan um, and it helps to reduce of course reduce risk for the lender and it helps to negotiate then uh, interest rate um, and and draw participation so um, again using Wilsonville's full faith and credit or bond rating um, to back any um, short or long-term loans uh, is a tool um, to consider in the toolbox. Um, second is, um, I just have a cautionary note on the preservation component. And I wanna make sure that if the conversation goes deeper and further, uh, there's a real difference, I believe, between preservation efforts to save existing affordable housing, even preservation efforts to save um, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing, like mobile home parks, um, versus um, preserving existing other existing housing stock. I have seen in community engagements how preservation of existing housing stock becomes a barrier to moving forward with redevelopment or uh, uh, doing cluster development, you, have, you know, to remove a house, one house to build back four um, has become kind of uh, a tool for uh, anti-development. So I, I just want to make sure we're very specific and nuanced in those areas around preservation. And then um, lastly, um, when I uh, was tracking the credit history conversation, um, particularly looking through an equity lens for supporting renters, um, I've seen uh, other municipalities, not in Oregon, but in other states, um, provide some type of landlord guarantee fund available, not you qualify based on credit scores. So if like a household doesn't have a credit score of right now, the low point I think is 670, Samuel, 
Um, maybe I don't I don't know if you all track that, but um, needing a minimum 670 in credit score to you know smooth for smooth sailing through an application process, if the city would guarantee the landlord if the landlord rents to that tenant and the tenant eventually has to leave because of non-payment of rent or whatever, um, the city would ensure that the landlord is whole out of the landlord guarantee fund. And it's tied again to credit scores. If that is a true barrier for people accessing um, rental housing. So thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, Eric, do you want to go next? I guess I kind of jumped the gun there. But I think that my thinking about mm -hmm. right of way improvements is probably the limit. All right, uh, Samuel, question? I Well, I, I mean, overall, I do think that these are good starting points. Um, as far as the accessibility um, piece goes, uh, I'm wondering if you can characterize what the incentives are um, that you have existing that you think could be a model. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dan Pauly um, if he could hop back on to talk about that. The, this is some code language that he's been working on developing in our newest urban growth area um, with some conversations with our uh, both our planning commission and city council. So, Dan. Thanks, Kim. So really, it's the accessibility is more uh, really focused on mobility disabilities. Uh, it requires essentially single level living with minimal stair entry. We call it mobility ready because uh, the in the proposed zoning ordinance, it doesn't necessarily require like universal design or the ADA upgrades uh, that would fall under a building code type things. It just really providing that unit that is single level or at least some of, or at least is you know primary on main and has all living facilities on a single floor with minimal stair access. And as proposed uh, in our new growth area, we're requiring five percent of expected units to fall into that. And there's a number of ways. A third of those can be uh, have be have an upstairs as long as all the facilities are, do exist on the ground floor you know bedroom bathroom and bedroom kitchen full bath uh and then the other two thirds need to be full single level living thanks i can definitely see the benefit of that um i would say that there we do have accessibility requirements in federal law for um four or more unit buildings. And so by pursuing um, policies that incentivize those structures, then we are also meeting, um, helping to meet the accessibility goals as well. Uh, quadplexes in particular, since they are um, allowed in single family neighborhoods, uh, you're, you're affirmatively furthering fair housing by getting those accessible units into existing single family neighborhoods rather than just having them concentrated in multifamily, which is where they have been. So uh, I think that that um, quadplex or above uh, incentives in particular um, really help to, to meet a few different goals. So um, that's a strategy that I would recommend um, being in there. Um, I'm also curious if the city has explored um, pre-approved plans as far as um, a strategy goes and if that would even be helpful I, I mean obviously that's going to be more helpful in cities that have a, a development backlog already but um we have not to this point um that being said I, I feel like this is something that we've seen come up in recent legislative sessions um I know Dan have you provided any 
city feedback on that or had any communications with the building division on specifics as to uh, I mean it's generally that. something yeah it's it's really about how the logistics work on the state level and uh, I mean if it can if it can be done I mean there's there's nothing that's been expressed locally that's against that idea All right, thanks. Um, let's move on. Um, so Dan, uh, if you could, I, I do see we have a Gloria from the Housing Authority who's joined us. Um, she's the alternate there for the Housing Authority. Um, so I wanna be able to hear from um, both Chris and then Gloria um, as to thoughts from their perspective. So Chris, I will turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, and again, this is my first meeting. I apologize for missing the last one. Um, in listening to this presentation and everybody else giving you know their thoughts and comments and feedbacks, um, I have a lot more questions than I have thoughts and comments. Um, my very first sort of comment or thought is, you know, I, I'm, I'm really pleased by the different strategies of housing and the different populations of need. Um, and, and in my opinion, each one in particular, you know, affordable housing and then the, the middle, it, these are quite different strategies. If you're, you know, just coming from my experience and perspective, um, prior to being the executive director of the housing authority, I was founder and executive director of, of, of a number of nonprofit organizations that served houseless individuals, um, starting, you know, with an organization that specifically prioritized houseless veterans. And the strategy of, of ending houselessness, you know, for a population like veterans is, is encompassing um, the idea of, of having emergency shelter, transitional housing, and then permanent supportive housing, and then being able to strategize graduating from PSH, from permanent housing, permanent supportive housing. And I'm just curious when we are talking about, um, you know, accommodating and, 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 and finding appropriate housing and ending houselessness, I, I guess, in, in the city of Wilsonville, do we have other strategies other than just permanent and or affordable housing? Is there a short-term strategy and a transitional strategy and then going into, to, long-term housing. Uh, and I know Beth um, brought up the point in time count and and, and I, I agree that the point in time count is grossly, um, you know, low in the numbers and, and I appreciate uh, Beth doubling it. Um, but I would also even in consideration in the strategy is, is how many folks from the city of Wilsonville have been displaced due to lack of housing, not just individuals that, that are currently houseless or undercounted in, in Wilsonville and Clackamas County, but have, are displaced in, in other communities. And what a strategy would look like to prioritize individuals and or families that have been displaced from Wilsonville um, to, to find housing. So just some initial thoughts, um, but yeah, again, happy to be here, just sort of listening, taking it all in and, and trying to jot down all my questions. Thanks, Chris. And I will say that, um, and we can talk more, I think these are good ideas and something that we do want to hear more as we move through the strategic planning process. Really, the extent to which um, we've gotten kind of into this work is what we've presented um, in terms of um, the, the strategy that was put together for the sleep, safe sleep sites. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about if that is something that, you know, as we grow and it, these regional issues exist, um, how we serve our unhoused populations is really important and, um, you know, not something that we've gotten into to any great degree. Um, I do see that Lee has her hand up. And so um, I, I maybe will transition over to you, let you ask a question and offer any thoughts you have. Okay, um, just because I obviously run the food pantry here and we deal with the homeless and we deal with uh, people trying to get an affordable housing, our issue, which is something I think that we kind of need to look at is a lot of them, they do have some income, 
they do they would be able to pay rent they just can't meet the qualifications of the application process of showing x amount of money towards their rent um you know some some of the complexes go up to three three percent you have to show three times the amount of income well they can't show that that's impossible when you're getting sixteen hundred dollars a month um that's our biggest um that's one of the biggest little holes we are finding and being able to help these people get off the streets or a family move into a new place is they're not they're not good enough to be able to get into the housing um and so i think you know i don't know if that's anything that is who's going to be doing the applications and who's going to be overseeing that is there a way that there is going to be allowed a little bit of wiggle room uh, to get these people in because some of them have enough money. They just can't qualify. So that's one of the things we are finding. Um, so Lee, did you have any other feedback or thoughts in terms of the discussion on mm -hmm. strategies? No, I'm good with that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I, Beth did, um, I, I saw that you unmuted. Uh, so wanted to check if you had any uh, anything else as it pertains to looking at the housing develop or housing production strategy. I had a question for Chris. Um, one of the city's uh, potential thoughts was a navigation center, um, which of course serves as emergency shelter, which we know that that's not proper housing but it's um, on that continuum you discussed. Did you have uh, opinions or, or thoughts of, is it a good idea? Who might the city look at who's done it well? Yeah, that's the great question. Um, I was actually, um, prior to coming to the Housing Authority, I was on a team, a consulting team that helped Lincoln County do their housing and, and homelessness assessment. And yep. they talked about a navigation center and a navigation center, in my opinion, is is only as um, uh, successful, for lack of better words, um, as as your resources available. You can build a beautiful navigation center. You can have showers. You can have you know, uh, laundry facilities. You can have an emergency shelter. But if there are no other resources in the community, your navigation center kind of falls flat. So uh, again, a really successful navigation center is one that would bring all of the other um, you know, community resources together. I think having an emergency shelter attached to a navigation center is, is great, um, but I've also seen models where if it's not attached, then you, know, you don't have some of those neighborhood uh, issues. Um, we can get into that you know, later. Um, but again, having ask, access to other resources within that navigation center is going to make it successful. But I, I believe to really combat homelessness in a community, you're going to need the step one. And that's that's the outreach. That's the navigation center. That's the emergency shelter. Step two was transitional housing. And I, I think even what Lee is talking about, you know, while individuals may have the financial needs, there's other barriers that they need to mitigate to get into affordable housing. Uh, yep. And then finally, you know, PSH and affordable housing. Uh, I've seen communities that that dive right into um, just developing affordable housing, which is great. I really believe in the housing first model. However, if we place individuals and families directly into affordable housing that don't have the supports um, and, and, and are next thing you know, they're evicted back to the streets, they are still looking for affordable housing and they have one more additional barrier uh, when it comes to to placing them into permanent housing. So so what I think I'm hearing you say is uh, Wilsonville, Kim, tell me if I'm characterizing this wrong, but this hasn't been an area that Wilsonville's uh, had strong partnerships on, to my knowledge, but I may be wrong about that. But building a navigation center, um, you know, step one is is about building those partnerships and making sure you can bring those services to it. Um, and so maybe this is um, something of a, a, a two step piece where, you know, you do the, build the, uh, the relationships and, and maybe building a navigation center doesn't even happen in this six year period, but you're sort of working up to that. 
Is that a is that an interesting way to think about that? And and helps thicken the um uh the relationships um uh around those kind of services. It, if you're asking me, absolutely. And and I don't want to speak for all of the county. Um, however, if if I were to say that there were uh, you know, interest in a navigation center. I know that there are other departments and divisions within Clackamas County that would that would show up that would be rather excited, um, you know, to to be there and to to serve individuals and families that are experiencing houses. Thank you, and I apologize, Kim, if I mischaracterized anything. No, um, and I do see that Councillor Barry has her hand up. So, um, Councillor Barry, are there any additional? Uh, any additional context you'd like to add? The, uh, part of the strategy for a housing plan is not only looking at providing future housing, but also being able to keep people in their house where they are now um, so that they can, the children can stay in their schools and people can stay in their communities. I think that's what strengthens Wilsonville is when people feel safe and secure. And um, so kind of stepping back, if you're looking at existing housing, I'd really like the city to do a study or think about, you know, what we can do to help people that, let's say currently renting, um, so that, you know, I don't know if it's rent control, but I know big corporations have bought a lot of properties and then they hike up the rent every year. And then I also heard about, um, I was talking to a renter who lives in a nearby town and uh, they were telling me how it's not only just the rents are going up, but the uh, apartment complex are now tacking on lots of extra fees. And so an example of the fee was if you, um, you forget your key, you, you left it somewhere. And so you need to borrow the extra key that the office has. And so they're calling it a locksmith uh, fee of $45. And um, they did some landscaping where they added some bark mulch out in the open community walkways. And so now they're charging the tenants for that. So those extra fees are, you know, in addition to all the other costs, those are expensive. And if that starts happening, you know, I don't know if it's happening in Wilsonville, but I, I'm thinking it probably will be if it's not. That would be really nice if, I don't know if the city can do strategies on rent control and that sort of thing, but at least we can have conversations. And then I'm really, I would be interested in learning more, you know, going forward about the city banking or financing tools where developers can obtain loans. Um, I know that other countries have had a lot of success where the public entities own the land. And so that cuts down a lot of cap costs. I'd be interested in learning more about that and cooperative housing choices. I don't know if we have any right now in Wilsonville, but I would love to explore to see how that works for going forward. So those are a few thoughts. Thank you. and. Beth, I just want to check in and see if there's anything you wanted to add. I think I saw you shake your head maybe on something. Um, so if there's any kind of, you know, maybe help boundary set for us, us here. The state controls rent control. Um, so the state sets that. So you could uh, lobby the legislature certainly for better rent control um, because what we've got now is... Um, uh, allowing a lot of rent escalation in some cases. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps you're interested, Councillor Barry, um, a little bit more broadly in some tenant protections. Um, some cities have pretty strong tenant protection programs. Um, I haven't looked specifically for, you know, something around extra fees, um, but I know that City of Eugene, for instance, has a, a, a comprehensive renter protection program. Um, that also gets at things like, uh, uh, what is it called, repairs and 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 that kind of thing, um, where landlords are um, choosing not to do those things. So m might that be interesting to you? Okay. Sam, I see you have your hand raised. 
I, I just also wanted to uh, add to that point that there is uh, nothing preventing local jurisdictions from adding protect, uh, fair housing protected classes as well. Um, a number of um, jurisdictions in Oregon have um, protected classes like uh, occupation or age over 18, for instance. Um, and the city of Salem uh, last year introduced housing status as a protected class. Uh, with the idea being that people who have experienced houselessness or are currently unhoused, that cannot be the reason that they are discriminated against when they are applying for housing. So, um, yeah, also, uh, you know, those kind of additional city level protections that could be explored. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Jennifer, I want to get over to you. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I've been really appreciating all the comments from all the other task force members. So, so thank you. I can. I'll try to carry that back to the planning commission. Two things that came to mind as we, you know, between the two meetings, and one is, I was looking at the comprehensive plan, and I was looking at our buildable inventory, you know, the uh, land and. A lot of it is infill. Like we've got Frog Pond East and West that's master planned, and there and we've got a few other large-ish lots, but there's a ton of infill. And on the comprehensive plan, it's designated as um, uh, not very dense. You know, the dwellings per acre numbers are very low, and I'm wondering if we need to revisit that so that way we can use those infill to get a lot of um, smaller and middle housing in. So that's one um, suggestion. And the other one is I know one of our existing strategies is to waive SDCs um, you know, for, for land that the city owns. And I'm wondering, do we have a vehicle or a means to make sure that those prices are retaken off of the sales price of the house, that it actually gets in the pocket of the buyer? So that's a good question. So the um, so I just uh, clarifying for you. So um, people like to use the term waiving STCs a lot, um, mm -hmm. and how we've historically approached it in the city of Wilsonville is that STCs are not something to be waived. They can be backfilled by another source, but in terms of actually kind of making ourselves whole and making our STC funds whole, the city. Um, does not just waive them and not require them to be paid. So the one instance recently, um, so there were two examples, I think, on the slides that were pointed to um, where we've looked at kind of waiving. Um, and so I think the ADUs, I don't I don't know that we, I'd have to actually go double check to see if we backfill those or not. Um, but those have been pretty limited in terms of um, you know, there's only been 16 SD or 16 ADUs that have come into place since that waiver has existed. Um, I, and so, you know, I think historically those have been SDCs that are paid on like an existing lot. We haven't seen that happen um, yeah. in any place where the ADU was built and then it was, you know, a middle housing land division. Um, so that's a good question. I, I'd have to take a look to see how we would approach that. Um, the other example being the most recent TOD project. And so that is something where a council made a decision to actually subsidize part of the STCs for that. Um, and so that was really just in support of kind of making that whole mix of financing for the project work. So those are not for sale units. And so we, we haven't I actually see. done that for any for sale units that we have. Um, and so, um, kind of the policy that we've used now. And, and that was that was not like a strategy that we will waive all SDCs for city owned properties. That was a choice made by council for this specific project. Um, and so, um, you know, just kind of, I think historically the city council has been pretty um, conservative with how we've approached either waiving or deferring SDCs as a city. Um, so that I think that's a good point, though, for future if if there was any future consideration of that as a tool. Um, okay, Beth, do you, you have anything to add there? I, I do. I think that's that's a really important point. And if you're going to put you know real money in, you should get something real out. Um, one way to do this for um, 
uh, for ownership housing would be to work with the community land trust, possibly with uh, a, a limited equity co-op. Um, and I'm more familiar with the community land trust, um, but um, essentially the community land trust owns the land. And when the housing is resold from the first uh, owner, they have limited equity in it. So they collect some of the equity, but not all of it. Um, and then the next household who buys that house um, buys it at a um, comparatively affordable price, whatever that is at that point. Um, and you know when they sell it, they uh, may be able to access some of the equity depending on how long they uh, live there. But that's a way to keep permanent affordability for uh, for ownership housing. The trick is there's just not enough um, capacity in our land trusts um, in the Portland area throughout the state. Um, but I think some of that could also be worked out with the development agreement around a limited equity co-op. Um, but that's the job of the land trust is to keep it affordable long-term. Gotcha. Uh, Sam? Uh, so I, I don't know if there's any examples of this, but I uh, currently in place, but I have seen some cities in the last round of HPSs look at scalable H SDCs. Um, and I'm wondering if that's an option uh, here to that, that could be pursued to, to incentivize that denser development. Good question. Uh, that was actually one component of part of one of the actions in the equitable housing strategic plan to look at that. And I'm going to call on Dan Pauly again, um, because he did do some initial uh, work on this. Um, if he is, there he is. Uh, and so he will provide, um, I think, a more eloquent response than I will. Oh, you're so eloquent, Kim. Thanks. Um, so we have looked at it, we've done studies, and uh, it's something that's on the table for integration as we uh, do different master plans and integrate it into our SCC schedule. Um, and we've also reviewed all the works the state's done. So um, yeah, I mean, we're up to date on that, but it, it doesn't happen easily. You can't just turn it on, right? It has to be integrated into a STC methodology at the time that you're updating project list and master plans. Thanks, Dan. All right, uh, I want uh, Gloria, if you have any thoughts or ideas you'd like to share with the group, um, please do so. Okay, thanks. Um... My my only comment is I'm not sure if you've already looked into the state revolving loan fund of the $75 million that was set aside to fill gaps in funding. Um, I think that could be a really useful tool for the city. And it's fairly new. Was that one of the recent, I feel like we've talked so many <laughs> <laughs> items related to grants or loans and it's hard to track what passes and what doesn't so um yep it's it's fairly recent I can if you want I can send you some information on it it's something that we've been um looking into to see if we could work with Oregon City on which is how I'm I'm familiar with it I I think that's we probably have like a surface level of understanding of it but in terms of a deep dive into it that is not something we've done yet so thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think we've gone through everybody here on the list. Um, I do, before we move back along, um, Beth, do you feel like you've gotten um, good feedback here? Is there anything else you would want to ask of the group before we move into that next step of kind of diving into some of these strategies a little more? Um, I need to reflect a little bit. So first of all, I think what I'm hearing is good list. Here are some other ideas. Um, uh, and uh, th these are good ideas. Um, some of them are, are partially in, some of them really aren't. Um, if the city mostly pursued 
the items that we had in, in red um, on the prior slides. Um, and you don't have to answer this now, um, but perhaps, you know, answering it um, in, uh, you know, in email um, to Kim as you're reflecting on this. If the city was really moving forward on those and some of the ideas that you all have brought up here, would there be something that we're missing? Um, uh, um, yes, that is my, my question. And I don't think we have to answer it here. I think it, it would take too much processing to answer it, for me at least. But are you suggesting, Beth, then, that that is a piece of feedback that you would like before we reconvene at our next meeting? If anybody has strong opinions about something that is not bolded in red, um, please give us those opinions. Okay. So um, when I send out the follow-up email after this, I will put in a little reminder prompt there. Um, you might have another grand idea that you did not bring to the table today because, you know, sometimes they, they come to you at the most random times. And so I think we're happy to still hear those as well. Um, so I will send that prompt to you as a follow-up. Um, are there any kind of other observations, thoughts, questions the group has? Um, we're really, we, I think we are a little bit ahead of schedule now here. So we do have a little bit of time. Um, I will note um, that for people who um, weren't at the first meeting, uh, if you do want to have a conversation with me to kind of get filled in or ask a couple more questions, I'm happy to um, arrange that time with you um, or really anybody else in the group. I, you know, happy to talk offline. Uh, so I do just want to offer that as well, that as you're thinking about this, you know, it's a lot of information um, that if you want to debrief and chat more, we can. So, um, Beth, anything else? Getting to my unmute, I'm sorry. Um, so at the next meeting for the actions that um, are looking most promising, both from the list we just showed and what we just heard, what we'll be bringing back to you is information about, you know, uh, what income levels would they apply to? Um, uh, what groups of people, um, if there's a group of people, would it especially apply to? Um, um, is it uh, complex or simple from a number of different perspectives? Um, uh, do we expect that it's, you know, really expensive or very inexpensive, um, that kind of information. So is there information that you, you know, particularly like to see about um, uh, the actions that we'll be bringing back to you and talking to you about in more detail that I didn't just list off? That I wasn't meaning to be comprehensive in that. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. I did see Chris unmute himself. Sorry. I just had a really quick thought. I don't want to be that person now. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, Beth, with the strategies that you've sort of um, red lettered, um, you know, the land acquisition one, for instance, comes to mind. With along with the strategies, have you thought of available resources, whether like in the state or the region that, um, could be accessible like OHCS's land acquisition program. And I mean, you know, or or when we're talking about like house of services, like utilizing Metro, anything like that. I mean, it, I, I'm just curious if along with the strategies, there are opportunities and available resources that we could actually tap. Um, and so that's a fair question. Um, that would usually be a little bit later um, in my thinking, but I think it's a good thing to think about sooner. Um, and Chris, uh, you make me nervous because I want to get everything 100% right, but you're going to know more than I do in some places. So what I will say is we can make a good effort to get in the ones that we, you know, know about and all of that. And there'll be other ones um, uh, that we, we don't necessarily, you know, have on our, our horizon. So um, with that, Grace, um, I think that's a good thing right. to add. That's great. Thank you. Chell? Thank you. Um, Beth, two thoughts in terms of presenting uh, back. Um, your chart that did impact, you know, had high impact versus low impact, right? 
So uh, come you pulling that again forward, right? So putting these strategies kind of on this, some of them are here, like the land acquisition. Um, you meant this to be kind of a uh, framing. Yeah, framing, but I think it also can serve really well in what's you know, map the strategies to this visual as well. Um so that we know, like, and so council members know, like, okay, we're adopting the strategy. Um, is it less impactful or more impactful? The expectation of it, right? And I think we typically do that. The thing I worry about that a little, Trell, is if we, even just saying partnering is less impactful, but partnering is often essential. It just doesn't do the thing on its own. Yeah. So, I, yes. I, yeah, I understand that. It's it, it takes more nuance. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was, is there any example or could you create a similar visual? Um, here's where I'm coming from. The data you shared suggests that 52% of Wilsonville's households are at 80% and below median income. Yep. The housing stock and the housing prices absolutely will not match that percentage. Yep. Right? Right. <laughs> So I'm wondering if there's a way to illustrate the strategies to income strata. Yeah, to this one. So knowing the strategy, is there a way to put on this chart, you know, this yes. strategy is going to be effective, primarily yes. effective to this income strata? Yes. Um, uh, and some things will be across all income strata, like zoning changes. Yeah. Um, but some things will be really specific to below 60% yeah. or people experiencing homelessness. And of course, that's not an income strata. Um, uh, yes, we include that. And we could probably turn that into a graphic. I don't know how horrible it would look, but I've got smart graphic people who can make it look better. Nice. That's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Eric? And so this is kind of a extrapolatory thought to the potential future, but it sounds like there's a lot of infill potential and you're trying to get all these different housing types in these programs coming together. But at the end, you know, I think a lot of the developers that might be doing this work will be smaller groups, kind of one-offs or people from diff coming from different regions. So having a clear website or information, something that makes that pathway really clean is a implementation tool. Thank you. And that, um, while we didn't put it explicitly in the memo, um, there was an action that was highlighted up front, which was that action 1E, the housing liaison that came out of our equitable housing strategic plan. So it was a bit of a multifaceted action, but part of what that got at too was kind of this notion of a one-stop shop for information on housing. Um, that being said, that that is not an action that we've actually been able to implement at this point. And so I think um, what I'm hearing is let's keep that, that idea in the hopper here on our list of strategies. Yeah, just from my perspective working at <clears throat> NOAA, I mean, we see a lot of smaller communities, I mean, the groups that get in and do the housing are not always who you think. And sometimes they're just interested parties and they are trying something new. So guidance is helpful to help little projects happen, especially small ones, especially small projects that don't have experience behind them. Thank you. Um, so I think all we have left is the next steps piece. Uh, so perhaps Beth, you can kind of speak to what these next steps are. And then Councillor Barry, if you have any further thoughts, questions, or closing remarks to offer, um, we can ask you to do that at the after we explain what's next. So we're going to be doing stakeholder interviews. And Nicole um, has been 
focus more on who uh, who we're looking at interviewing. Um, but the idea is to interview people um, at this point who uh, essentially can help us understand those unmet housing needs. So it's oftentimes uh, people who are service providers, um, et cetera, so that we get more, more meat there. Um, not on this slide, but um, I expect will happen, maybe not before the next task force meeting, um, is the community conversations, um, the conversation guide. So a different type of outreach. Um, we're going to be pulling together a memorandum that is essentially uh, the actions that we've talked about, um, saying a little more about what they are and then providing some of that information that we just talked about, about you know potential impact income served, uh, you know, potential effectiveness, um, whether it's going to cost a lot or a little, um, whether it'll provide funding, um, th those kind of things. Um, and uh, we haven't tried to schedule our next uh, task force meeting, um, but that meeting will really be a second version of the same conversation of, do we have the right actions? Are we missing anything? Um, the city is going to have to have some discussion. Um, and when I say the city, I mean staff and decision makers about how much can we reasonably do in our HPS? Um, uh, because 35 actions for a six year period for a city the size of Wilsonville with Wilsonville staff, um, either they're really tiny actions and maybe not very impactful um, or there's just too many. Um, so, you know, uh, I want to encourage the city to land on the right number of actions and the right number isn't a normative thing that I know. Um, I just know that it's way easy to make a long action plan that has too much stuff in it. So I expect that culling of actions, that forced set of choices will end up happening um, a little bit later beyond um, meeting number three. Um, so um, hopefully at meeting number three, we have uh, we don't discover we're missing a lot of actions and then we're going to have to sort of start chunking them down. And that is what I have for you, Kim. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Barry, would you like to close this out? Um, well, uh, I thought this was a good discussion. I was really impressed with that we have a variety of, of different viewpoints that are representing different perspectives and expertise. So thank you again for everybody putting together their time. I'm looking forward to getting a copy of your slides and uh, putting more thought into our strategy. I feel that Wilsonville is really lucky because we do have land that's available for new housing. Um, I go to Clackamas County meetings and I you know, listen to other cities where they're landlocked and they don't have the land that's available and they're really struggling, like what are they going to do? But we have more options available and we have great staff that can help us uh, put together a good strategy. So um, thank you again, everybody for your time. All right, um, I will send the follow-up email uh, you'll get that in the next week. And in the meantime, please reach out with any other questions. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy the afternoon.